Everybody see that? Uh -huh. Okay, let me just make that a bit more neat. There we go. So, um, or good evening, uh, whatever part of the world you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Zain Sharif, and um, I'm going to be delivering this talk with Dr. Kuro. Um, and we're going to talk about CRT LV lead placement. So uh, this talk will focus on the how, uh, not really why we do CRT, but just a few quick slides on why we do CRT. So uh, I practice in the Republic of Ireland, and um, so I, there is more of a European slant in my practice, even though I did train in the United States. Um, so briefly, recommendations for CRT in patients in sinus rhythm, in those who have left bundle branch block, uh, QRS morphology. CRT is recommended in symptomatic patients in, with heart failure and sinus rhythm when the LVEF, uh, LV ejection fraction, is below or equal to 35%. QRS duration is more than or equal to 150 milliseconds and left bundle branch block QRS morphology despite best medical therapy in order to improve symptoms and reduce morbidity and mortality. And that's a class one indication in the European guidelines. If the QRS is between 130 and 150 milliseconds, um, despite medical therapy, that depends usually, and the duration of medical therapy depends on if it's after a heart attack or not. Um, if it's um, outside the context of a heart attack, usually three months is the amount of time we give. Now, if the QRS is 130 to 150, it becomes a 2A indication, so it should be considered. And if you don't have a left bundle branch block, um, if, you've symptom if you've symptoms uh, in heart failure and an LVEF is below or equal to 35%, and your QRS is greater than or equal to 150 with non-left bundle branch block, you can also it should also be considered. So those are the most concrete um, indications for implanting a CRT in sinus rhythm. So um, back into the how, uh, this is a case uh, that I had during the week and I just thought I'd throw it up. Um, sorry about that. Um, so this is a gentleman with a single chamber pacemaker and he uh, developed a, what we thought was a pacing induced cardiomyopathy where he was pacing 100% of the time from his pacemaker and his heart function was declining, we felt, as a result. He possibly had some amyloid overlap. Um, no underlying rhythm, so we brought him to the lab for an upgrade. Uh, he was, his life expectancy was bordering on it. You know, we, we were, his, his own preference was to avoid a defibrillator component of the CRT. And also when life expectancy is questionable over greater than a year, um, uh, a CRTP rather than a CRTD was a better choice for this gentleman. And his Q pace QRS was about 190 milliseconds. So we're going to obviously go to the talk and then I'll show you the end results um, in this case. Um, but this is um, us cannulating the CS and making our plans for putting in our CS lead next. Uh, obviously, one of the first things that you may see is that the balloon isn't fully opacifying this, the coronary sinus, this uh, particularly dilated coronary sinus. Um, and again, we're going to talk more about um, how we may tackle cases like this. So I'll go back to this case again after, uh, during the slide set. So planning is obviously very important. Um, ideally, we have a continuous ECG, uh, defib pads on the chest if we induce uh, a ventricular arrhythmia or if we need to pace. Um, PSA cables and cautery if you have access uh, on the field. Usually start with a venogram to outrule the left persistent SVC and also to guide access. I usually get access with a micropuncture and ultrasound guided axillary vein um, access um, following a venogram. But again, uh, there's different ways to get access. And I know there's already been a talk uh, on this topic. Uh, sheets um, to facilitate whichever uh, guide sheet you're going to use. Your CRT equipment is going to you know, consist of your delivery sheets, uh, your sub-selectors, leads, guide wires, and a balloon to opacify the coronary sinus. And we're going to, again, talk to these um, as we're going along. And then I know we're going to be, uh, there's going to be a future talk on left bundle branch pacing equipment. Sorry, left bundle branch uh, pacing. 
And uh, I use lip bundle branch uh, pacing as a bailout. Um, or if uh, there is no corner sinus option, um, and there'll be future talks on this, which is an exciting field. And obviously more data uh, is coming and we wait that. Uh, and I think it's coming very soon at HRS actually. I think there'll be a few talks on it, maybe an RCT. Um, so uh, other general considerations with CRT planning, if they have a prior angiogram, a late phase of uh, the left angiography can be very helpful. I'll show one or two slides. Uh, and analyzing the echocardiogram, uh, if there's a big dilated right atrium, that might influence what sheet you're going to use. Um, obviously, antibiotic prophylaxis um, has a role. Um, sit, how you're going to sedate the patient if needs be, and then if it's a device upgrade, you know, to identifying your, you know, the while well, doing a venogram initially, and also to identify the connectors that may uh, be needed on the day. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Ekaru, uh, do you would you have any other sort of thoughts about planning cases with CRT or? I think the um, you've already mentioned like really the biggest things. Um, the most important, I think, is the venogram because I think that a lot of people skip that step, and the venogram, no matter how recently the other device was if it's for a device upgrade. Um, no matter how recently the other device was, you really do want to do your venogram because if you don't, you might be surprised when you open up that pocket. So um, that's really important. Um, but no, everything that you're saying is pretty much how I plan mine. Thanks very much. Totally agree on the venogram front. You don't want any nasty surprises once you open the pocket and you're trying to get down to the harsh. Um, so just we talked about very quickly if they had a prior angiogram, a late phase, um, late phase images can be quite helpful. So this is a case where a gentleman had a diagnostic angiogram, and you can see the shadow of the coronary sinus at the very end of the uh, the shot. And then when this patient came back for a CRT, uh, you can see here that it maps very similarly to what the late phase showed, which is obviously not surprising. And it just helps in terms of, you know, going into the case, you know, if they may need a particular type of subselector, or if it looks like a small or a large branch, what type of lead you may end up using, um, which is obviously very um, helpful and uh, time efficient. So, um, Obviously, step one after, uh, well, we obviously get venous accessed and then we put our wires down. Um, we would start usually with the RV lead placement if needs be. Um, if there is a, if it's a CRTD, um, start with the defibrillator lead as well. And the reason is if these patients are not only be, it does it, uh, you know, you want to routine for these cases, but these patients have often quite wide left bundle branches. And if you knock the right bundle when you're trying to get into the coronary sinus, you can get complete heart block and it becomes a much more messier case. Temporary pacing is something you want to avoid. So having the, the RV lead in is very helpful from the get-go. And now that we're going through fluoro shots of the heart, let's just revisit basic images and cardiac anatomy. So uh, when we're in the heart, we obviously look in two views to help guide us where we need to be. So in LAO, we're seeing the heart head on. So the heart is um, essentially looking at you. The septum is looking at you. So you can see here in this um, in this alveogram. So the essentially um, the septum is going to be if your if your right ventricle is here, your septum is going to be right here in the middle. And then in RAO, you're kind of be going, going to be looking right down the heart. So there's a better, better, this is probably a better sort of demonstration of um, when we look, when we say LAO and RAO. So again, the heart is almost like an ice cream, like a reverse ice cream cone. And then in LAO, it's looking directly at you. And then RAO, you're looking kind of basal down at the apex of the heart. And that's also helpful when we're, we're trying to see whether we've got into the coronary sinus, when we're trying to identify the different branches of the coronary sinus and guiding our lead down. In LAO, we can see um, if the septum is looking at us, we can see it's when we almost cross through the interatrial septum where we're not really crossing through it, we're actually going through the coronary sinus orifice, through the coronary sinus and over to the lateral side of the heart. And in RAO, we can see uh, our leads threading towards the apex um, 
from the base and we can uh, almost identify the course of those corner sinus branches a bit better as they course towards the apex. Um, Dr. Ekaru, would you would you uh, have anything else to add there or in terms of uh, when we get our venogram and we're looking at the branches? Okay. No, yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> All righty. So this is when we're looking at LAO, as we said. So this is obviously our, uh, you know, kind of head-on shot in LAO. At this stage, we have our, you know, our RV lead, our atrial lead here. Our intraatrial septum is going to be here. That's where the ostium of the coronary sinus is. We've placed a delivery sheet within the coronary sinus, and we've inflated our balloon, and we've injected dye. And the dye is lighting up our coronary sinus branches. Now, it's a nice view to see, you know, wh which, how we classify our branches when we do identify them. So we have a posterior branches down below, MCV branch can, or is off, is seen um, quite near the orifice branching in towards the inferior portion of the heart. And as we start to go up, we have a posterior, postural, lateral. So this side of the heart is lateral. Then we have a, obviously our lateral branches here. We go higher up, anterolateral, anterior. So the top of the heart is more anterior um, and um, down here is posterior. And as we continue, we get to the AIV. So this is very useful to see where the origins of these branches are. But we'd want to know, you know, just we obviously we want to get more than one view because we want to see um, how these branches behave as they go towards the apex. And this is when we switch to ARIO. So like we said, we're looking at the base over to the apex. So as we've injected, you can see the branches course towards the apex, towards the apex and can give us a guide in terms of um, you know, lead, which leads we'll select. Um, and also there is prognostic value of placing leads more basal and mid rather than towards the apex. Um, and again, there'll be some more slides on that later on. So the next, so obviously we talked about the coronary sinus. So it's obviously before the tricuspid valve uh, within the right atrium. Um, usually a good tip is um, what I usually do is I kind of, I, I, I'm a big fan of the deflectible sheet. I mean, there's obviously, there's many different ways to do this. Um, I usually would use a deflectible CS uh, guide sheet wired to the RV. And then I would clock the sheet so that it becomes, um, we turn more set, I would, I would, uh, I would rotate the CS sheets that it is pointing towards the septum, we draw it back and usually pops in uh, quite nicely. But sometimes, it, you know, it, it, there's obviously a lot of variation to where the coronary sinus orifice is. And again, there'll be some more slides on that. And you may need different sheets for different anatomies. And um, again, uh, we'll talk to cannulating the CS in future slides, but this is roughly where the coronary sinus is, kind of where, where the intraatrial septum is before the tricuspid valve. And obviously our goal is to place our CS lead in the target vein. Um, so what equipment do we need to get the lead in? So delivery sheets, um, plus or minus a subselector. A balloon can be helpful. Now, I mean, if you get a good hand injection as well, some, you, you might not need a balloon, but I tend to use a balloon for all my cases. Um, balloon does carry the, you know, the potential risk for uh, dissection, but if you're careful and if you manip your, manipulate your balloon in the right way, you can greatly minimize that risk. And what I usually do is I kind of, I have my delivery sheet and pass the balloon to the tip. I usually give a bit of contrast within the, um, within the delivery sheet for the balloon and withdraw the sheet backwards over the balloon. So not pushing the balloon into a side branch. I'm, I'm not sure, do you, would you use a, something similar, Dr. Crew, or use a different technique? That's exactly what I do. And, you know, um, what I try to do is move my, put my guide wire all the way up, you know, as far as I can. And then um, once I have, I, the only difference between, I heard that you said that you like the um, deflectible sheath. I usually will use the fixed shape sheath, but over an AL2 
um, because I find that that catches that little hook at the end of the AL2 that on my last trip to Nigeria, actually two trips ago, um, Dr. Adafi told me, he was like the amplats left. And I was like, what amplats? We're using the AL2. And he was like, that's what it stands for. I was like, oh, there you go. So, you know, um, the AL2, um, it has that nice hook that just catches on. And, you know, um, depending on how big that atrium is, sometimes I have to use, rare cases I've used an AL3 um, to have enough reach to get me there. Um, but once I do that, um, over capture the, um, capture the CS off, then I put my wire over into the CS, move my um, delivery sheath over that and go as far in as possible. And exactly what you said, basically getting the balloon to the end of the sheath and then withdrawing the sheath over the balloon after I've puffed is a very, you know, important step to reduce, um, you know, dissection. Because yes, you can place a lead depending on how the dissection goes, but sometimes it's just, you just lose all your landmarks and it just, Same. it's not even worth it. Yeah, no, thanks for that. It's very, very insightful. But my partner, actually in the program, the hospital I work in, used the AO2 as well um, as his weapon of choice as well. And again, it's very, it, it can be very, very effective. So yeah, it's, there's, it's um, really there's quick, Zane. Many different ways oh, sorry, Doctor Doctor Sharif. What uh, what wire do you typically use uh, for the balloon? So I, I have a um, mm. older rep that is insistent on using like an O two four or some odd shaped wire specifically for balloons mm. to avoid any kind of like beveling effect. Have you seen that, yeah. or do you just use an O one four wire? Or? I typically don't don't use a wire through it. I usually just pass it to the end would draw back and, and um, back. I know you can you know and I, I have once or twice if especially if there's two branches like if the CS almost like bifurcates um, mm. and tried to get a balloon into one of these branches you can and I actually would have used a an O2 I think it's an O2 five I think um, yeah, it's... and that can be helpful if you've two kind of equally sized branches um, but typically I don't I don't wire um, the yeah. balloon itself yeah, I think the balloon is an O2 five that can go through mm. it most of the time. Mm. Yeah, but it has, it has a role sometimes. Um, okay, so that should actually read CS leads and then guide wire. Um, so yeah, many different sheets. This obviously doesn't encompass all of them, but the main message of this slide is that there's there's different options. Um, you know, as uh, Dr. Akrua said, there can be like, for example, the AL2 and the AL3 for, um, for more of a reach. There can be um, the specific right-sided sheets as well. Um, this is typically what I would use in a chain defectable. But again, um, it's just sometimes it's what people are, what folks are used to and have had experience with. Um, so, so at this stage, you know, I, we would have, you know, got a wire into the CES or we have our sheet into the CES and then we wire up and get our sheet into the coronary sinus. Um, we pass our, if you choose to do balloon venography, you've identified your branches. And then the next step is getting into um, the, get into the branch itself. Now, to get it, you obviously, the components of your next steps are going to be a coronary sinus lead. Uh, a wire, um, which you pass through the coronary sinus lead to get into the branch itself. And then you kind of, if if you need it, there is uh, an option of subselectors, which are small um, sheets that go through your guide sheets to help get you into these little branches as well. And there's a few different types as well, and they can be helpful um, depending on the angle of these uh, of these uh, of these branches. And then even the CS leads have different um, uh, shapes and uh, they can conform to, if you see a large, if you see a large uh, coronary sinus branch, if you see a med like sort of an intermediate, or if you have a small coronary sinus branch, it can help guide what type of uh, lead you use. Now the different companies have different leads, but for example, they can be widely spaced to get into large branches. Um, they can be straighter, like a straight can be very helpful. There's some of these coronary sinus leads have active fixation as well, which I found helpful in some cases where you actually get the wire into the end of the, um, coronary sinus branch, you thread the lead 
not to the very end. You don't completely wedge it. And then you can actually rotate it about four or five turns. I think the company says five turns. And then with a push and pull method, actually show that you can wedge the lead there, which can be very helpful. You know, that it does seem to reduce your dislodgement rate. Um, but again, it, it really conforms to the anatomy that you're targeting. I, I don't know, Dr. Guru, do you want to jump in there in terms of leads and subselectors? So I find that, you know, um, if we go back to the um, subselectors, um, I find that the obtuse, I end up not really using that as much just because if you, um, most of the time the wire, um, your 014 wire can kind of make its way down there without necessarily need of a subselector. Um, so I end up not really using those, but the times that I see a branch that either looks like the 90 degree or the acute, I end up using a subselector for that. Um, and most of the time, honestly, I actually use the 135, which is the acute, because it's, it really, if, even if it's a 90 degree, that hook just helps you catch on to it so that um, you're able to, um, you know, select that branch. So that's the one that's usually my workhorse. And then sometimes I would use a 90 if the angle doesn't seem as acute. Right. Yeah, no, I think I would do something. I, I tend not to end up pulling it out of the, the bag of tricks for, for these obtuse ones um, myself. Um, great. So there can be, um, uh, but this slide just points to when you're inserting a lead down your sheet, there's different tools to allow you to insert it um, uh, more smoothly. Um, these leads have evolved over time. Um, nowadays, we have our quadrupolar leads, which are very helpful because we could pace between vectors. Um, it narrows the sort of uh, electrical field um, between um, which we can pace, which is very helpful when you consider that you know, the phrenic nerve isn't too far away uh, from these leads quite often. And um, if we're trying to get identified the best vector, in order to maximize our resynchronization, more is obviously better and more options is better. And this slide sort of um, points to that. You know, there's, you can obviously pace between the CS lead and the RV. You can pace from CAN to RV. You can pace between these vectors itself, um, between these poles themselves. So during the, during the case, it's obviously very helpful to identify, to, you know, pace from different uh, poles and just see how um, how best we can achieve resynchronization, QRS narrowing. Uh, there's other parameters as well, which I know we'll talk about later on, including QLV. Um, but it, these are important to test after you, uh, mm -hmm. as soon as you put the lead into an area you think might look like a nice desirable location. Um, so this is just going over what we've talked about already when we're corn uh, when we're cannulating the coronary sinus. So um, obviously when we're, like we talked about, there's different ways to do this, but um, when we're passing the CS delivery system down, we have a wire down in the, um, I, down the SVC, then into the IVC, we pass our delivery sheet, including the dilator um, over the wire into the atrium, remove the dilator. And then at this stage, our, our CS delivery sheet will almost look toward, well, you can, you make it point towards the RV. Um, and you can either directly uh, pass towards the CS or over a wire. I usually do it over a wire into the RV and then pull back into the right atrium, rotating it with some counterclock um, to try and guide it into the coronary sinus. But obviously, there's other way, there's, there's various ways to do this. Um, in terms of the actual delivery sheet, so um, there's different curves um, depending on the, the location and takeoff of the CS. So you can have um, more steeper sheets as well if there's a, a higher takeoff and medium to large size red atriums 135 multipurpose can sometimes be quite helpful and then wider hooks as well if there's a more vertical takeoff of the CS can be helpful as well there's also an extra wide um, option and many of these many of the companies have right-sided sheets as well now on the substitute sheets I know you've already talked uh, touched on already uh, Dr. Akrua any anything else or I think you've already covered this, which you're talking about the your your choice of sheet itself. 
And I think that um, because, so for the patient who has, you know, a dilated right atrium, I think it's really important to basically, yes, we try to use one size fits all. I think everybody has a workhorse that they typically use, but then there's sometimes you have to recognize that, oh yeah, this is not going to work. And so that's why those first steps, looking at your echocardiogram, even looking at the heart that's in front of you when you're on x-ray is really important. Um, and also recognizing that, you know, from the right side, it can be very difficult. Um, so using a right sided sheath or a straight sheath when you're coming from the right is really um, important. Um, so just understanding your challenges before you go in can really help make the day go a little bit smoother. Um, one thing that um, is really important also to recognize is that, you know, for these patients who have heart failure, just the presence of heart failure, LV um, dilatation changes the relationship of the CS to the rest of the heart. And so what you typically will see is that the, um, um, the CS ends up becoming less funnel shaped, more slit shaped and goes a little bit, um, goes a little bit posterior. And so you really want to grab it and just be aware of where it is before you start forcing um, you know, your um, wire, your guide wire through. So that's very um, on the ball. Um, and we'll also talk about anatomy when it comes to CS uh, origins and valves and whatnot, which can make every CS uh, different as well. It also, that also, um, your point also kind of speaks to the importance of the venogram, the right-sided sheet, pulling that out in the get-go uh, is obviously the way to go if there's a right-sided option only. Um, okay, so once we get into the coronary sinus, um, sometimes a small puff of contrast can be very helpful to confirm that it's, you know, within the, within the CS itself. And once you're in wiring up and getting your sheet in a bit, you know, not, so it's not just sitting right in the CS, is is uh, very helpful. You don't want the CS to fall out just as soon as you're in. It's one of the most painful things that can happen to a cardiologist, like a physiologist. Um, so how do we, how, how would we maybe know that we're in the coronary sinus, not the RVOT? So we talked about it already in LAO, you want your lead to be, you know, going towards the lateral side of the heart. Um, and an REO, it's more of a sort of a, a line that would follow typically where it transects your right atrium and your right ventricle. Um, and these are little tips when you pass your wire up that you're actually within the CS. Um, and again, that puff of contrast is very helpful. So then with the venogram, we, we kind of talked to this already. Um, you know, we passed the, our, our balloon up to the tip of the, um, to the tip of the sheath, um, then draw back the delivery sheath over the back, over the balloon tip and inflate the balloon itself and then inject our contrast um, of uh, saving the cine. And this is gonna be like a roadmap for us. Usually you want to do this in LAO and REO, so this can guide um, your uh, lead placement. You don't want to be doing, you know, multiple venograms. So getting a good quality venogram at this stage is very important. You don't want to subject the patient to huge contrast loads if you can avoid it. And this is typically what the balloon looks like. So you have a, a port where you can inflate air in and then a port that you can inject contrast in as well. Usually to save um, fluoro, you can actually pass the uh, the balloon in a fair bit until there's about at least four four lines. That usually means that you're, you don't have to keep stepping on fluoro. And um, then you can floor to make sure that you don't, you're not passing the balloon out blindly into the CS and cause a dissection. And again, we talked to anatomy of the CS. This is kind of what it looks like in PA where you have your branches, middle, posterior, posterior, lateral, lateral, and as you go higher, there's more anterior branches. And this is again, a uh, an example of a good quality venogram where you've, um, where, I mean, they maybe could have gone a bit more proximally. I mean, it's not quite clear here, but you still have identified a pretty good lateral uh, branch here. Um, and you can see here, of course, is, uh, laterally, you can see just how the size of it and the continuation of the CS after that. 
Um, so this at this stage, you're getting an RAO and an LAO is very useful because um, it, you know, both views tell you quite a lot of information. So then in, in this slide, um, this again is in uh, kind of shows us the basal mid and apical um, sections of the CS. So this, you know, ideally we don't want to be too apical. Uh, again, there is some data to suggest that going too apical, you're not going to get as much of a benefit if you're mid. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's it's measuring that it, against stability of the lead and your your options as well. Um, I'm not sure you want to jump in there as well, uh, just in terms of when you have your venogram and identifying, you know, um, what might be your optimal target. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you said it correctly, you know, studies have shown that if it's the more apical it is, the less likely is actually um, to be helpful. And I think maybe some of that data might have been as a result of, um, you know, maybe a nodal stem, um, I'm not sure because we don't really quite know as much of the um, the data. The it wasn't as granular data; it's mostly like group data that they got. So mm -hmm. if you're kind of pushing the lead down as much as you have, if the only thing that you have is a unipolar lead that was able to get all the way down there, then who knows? Maybe that might have been a reason. I this is just me supposing. But, um, you know, nowadays we have so many different options. Um, the quad lead has given us, you know, so much um, that we're able to do now. So even if you are able to get a lead down and you have a big branch and your most distal lead is apical, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you need to pace, right? Because you have all the four poles. So it really, um, the tools that we have now kind of make um, this a lot less painful than it used to be. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Um, and certainly um, those studies are, you know, are a bit of um, in the, you know, not, not, not yesterday, but um, having an L3, L4 option, for example, which is up here, when you have your lead wedged here is very different to only having, you know, your pole there as, um, as you were saying. So that's, that's a very good point. Um, so we did touch on this already and we touched on this. So, uh, and again, we touched on that. So the different types of leads. Um, so again, there's different types of coronary sinus uh, leads themselves. And as well as that, there's different types of wires. And I don't think we've talked about wires too much. And I might touch on, touch on that before I um, pass over the baton to my colleague here. Um, if you have... Um, you know, there's different companies which do different wires, but there's stiffer wires and there's more uh, softer wires. You might sometimes be in a quite a curvy, like a curvy, curvy um, sort of branch, and you might find it difficult to get the wire down and then your CS lead sort of to guide it over that wire towards the, towards the kind of into a good stable position. Sometimes having a stiffer wire can be helpful in those regards. Sometimes actually getting a subselector in behind you and giving a bit more support can be very helpful. But sometimes a stiffer wire can sometimes open up the wire itself, open up the branch itself and allow you to thread your, your lead down um, in a bit more of a controlled fashion. Now that's obviously weighed up against the risk of dissection um, because these stiffer wires can be a bit more aggressive. Um, but, you know, for example, using a, a wire like a mailman may sometimes uh, help open up options for you where a whisper might, you know, might not be doing the job. So no, having a knowledge of the different wires is very, very important, as well as having a, an idea of the actual CS leads themselves. So things like wider spacing might be better for long vessels that accommodate the large S-curve and all its electrodes. Narrow spacing might be an option for smaller, more basal veins. And then there's options like a double bend for, for example, medium-sized vessels. And then in Medtronics, they have, for example, they have, and I, I know we're just fixing, we're not, we're fixing, this is just one company and all the different, um, well, th this slide here is pointing towards one company, but we've, you know, there's all the different companies. It's worth knowing about the leads from every single company to know your full armature when you're going into these cases. Um, and they just make you a better implanter as well by using different companies. So the larger vessels having like a larger S shape, whereas the smaller vessels having like a straight or even the stability quad, like we talked about earlier, where you can actually do an active fixation. Um, and with that, I might jump off if that's okay, guys, and hand over.
Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. I appreciate it. That was that was fantastic. No problem. Doc. Thanks for having me. And then, um, Dr. Kuro, you have a copy of the slides, or do you have your own slides just before we pass on the baton here? You're muted. Sorry. I still haven't learned. I have a copy of the slides, so you can, um, if I can share. Yeah. I'll come off there now. Great. Thanks again, guys. Bye, Dr. Shi. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Let's see. I'm going to take away his host just one second. Okay. There you go. Um, so as you're pulling it up, one thing I mentioned in the chat, um, when we're talking about wires, especially soft wires like 014s, make sure to keep a couple on hand because um, in a difficult case, you'll follow up a number of those. Uh, they tend to, to get knotted up at the end. So and then Dr. Dafe. I uh, just wanted to say, he wanted to mention that AL2, that it works great. Yeah, we typically use that AO, AL2 as well. Uh, Dr. Kuro, that's that's the most popular one I'd say that we use in St. Louis and in, in Boston. So, so um, you guys have my slides or you guys see my screen rather? Yep, yeah. see you there. All right. So um, we basically already talked about, um, you know, the different types of leads that are available. Um, and also just kind of recognizing, and this of course comes with practice, recognizing the different kind of veins you have um, and what um, would be um, necessary. So sometimes you have a choice of two different kinds of veins, you know, that are really sometimes just spoiled for choice, right? You have a really big honking vein and you're like, oh, this is great. And then you have one that's just a little bit smaller, but it's just, you know, to the side. And you'd be surprised that the experienced implanter will go for the smaller vein um, and you might wonder why well it's because vein st um, the lead stability might actually be better in that vein that's a little bit smaller um, so hold on one second okay <laughs> excuse the um, dancing baby in my background <laughs> so um so sometimes you might be surprised that the experienced implanter would actually go for the slightly smaller vein um, because of the, um, the ability or the, the, the stability of the lead, um, or the stability of the lead in that um, particular vein versus the large vein. I've seen a lot of large veins, a lot of leads come out of large veins by the time you split. And actually in one interesting case I had, as the heart was beating, we had it in there and we split everything and everybody's just watching. And as the heart was beating, it just went boop, boop, boop out. <laughs> so that was like, okay, so that wasn't the vein. I, I went for the easy one and I paid for it. But um, luckily we hadn't um, taken off the short sheet. So um, that was good. We just ended up putting it back in, which brings me to another point. So there are some folks who will, they're putting in the LV lead and they just go straight, instead of going with a short sheath, then the long um, guide sheath, they go directly with the guide sheath, which, you know, can be, you know, yes, you're not splitting an extra sheath, but then in situations where you lose access, that means you have to get access from your vein all over again. So that could become a problem. Um, and also, you know, if you have, if, and as all of you know, you know, accessing the vein, you could have a lot of spasm to the vein. So a vein that you were very easy to get at the beginning of the case might not be so easy to get by mm -hmm. you, know, you being an hour in. Um, and of course, all these things happen in a difficult case. So I always will go, even if I think, okay, yeah, this is going to be quote unquote easy. I never think of that when I walk into the room. So that's number one. But then the second thing is I still do use my short sheath and then go through that with the longer sheath. So um, basically um, for the active fix lead, which is amazing, um, you know, for those bigger veins, this is a great um, solution for that where you could just basically insert the lead. You don't have to even wedge it all the way in, um, which, you know, for those really big honking veins, you know, wedging it might mean you're going all the way to the apex and wrapping around. So you don't want to go all the way around. Um, and so you stop in the middle, you fixate where you want it to be. And then you just cough about five or six times until you build up torque. Um, and then what you do is you, first of all, I usually will push it first to see if, 
you know, I see my um, outer sheath, my guide sheath buckling back because then that means that, okay, I'm generating enough force that um, it's not, and it's not moving anywhere. And then I do the pull. And then, so I push a little bit and then I pull and as long as I know that, okay, the um, helix is fixated, then I slip my sheets. And, you know, it's also another tool that has offered um, great, um, what is it called? Great um, options for you when you're putting in your quad leads. So, you know, sometimes um, you're spoiled for choice and sometimes you just have one branch that is huge in the area that you want it to be. Um, and um, that's pretty much um, all you can go for. And so this basically just shows an example of the push and pull. So here is beforehand, here you're pushing it. So you know, the lead looks exactly the same, but you can see that outer, um, that guide sheath pushing back and buckling on itself. So that tells you that, okay, well, you are in a good position and it's not moving. And so once you've done that, you check um, your um, electricals again. And um, once everything's good, then you can um, slit your sheet. Dr. Um, oh, Dr. Kerr, yes. um, on that previous slide, Mm -hmm. Sorry if you don't mind me jumping. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out to the to the group here. So you see they have an extra that I assume that wires in the main mm -hmm. um, sheath, correct? So the, yes. so here they've used like a buddy wire, which can really help you with stability and retaining access to the CS if things push back. And then another thing that you kind of pointed out here is that that buckling of the sheath as it pushes away. Um, you know, be mindful of where the CS OS is. If you start losing your sheath, if it comes out, it's going to naturally pull up, especially if it has a curve to it, and it could pull your whole system back. Mm -hmm. um, and I, hope, I hope you don't mind me chiming in. I don't want to do it when oh, Zane no, was no, talking because no, he was in a he was in a hurry, yeah. but we got a little more time. So no, 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 no. totally, totally um, appreciate the um, extra help. Do you use um, buddy wires in your practices? Typically, I have or? not had to, so oh, cool. it's kind of um, okay. I see. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I don't know, but like I, I've seen people do it. I just haven't needed to. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so, um, any other questions or any other comments? Uh, no. So I guess we used to use them a little more in St. Louis. Um, and if you if you're using a large outer, if you use an inner, it really isn't possible because you need to have two French sizes with an 037. Uh, mm -hmm. to fit. But if you're using just an outer, the inner diameter of your typical outer is eight French. So a buddy wire will, an 035 wire will fit beside your lead. Um, mm -hmm. So if you do uh, in your other practices um, to the rest of the group out here, if you do ever use one, it, it is an option, but it won't work through an inner. Through your outer, you can put it in the main body of the CS and bury it into the apex or as far as it'll go through the mm -hmm. AIV. And that way it just has an extra you know, layer of support, it can help keep your outer sheath from backing up. And then if it does back up, you may be able to run back up over it if you can sometimes, so. And maybe that's the reason why I end up not using it that much because whenever I am very quick to use an inner cathode, inner mm. sheath, I'm very quick. Like there's yeah, some yeah. people who will say, oh, I'll just try. I'm like, no, that's anything that's 90 degrees, like it looks like even 70 degrees or lower, I'm like, eh, just give me an inner and I go. Just an inner. It. So I, I don't it's, even try. You know how to slit then. Uh, there's some, yeah. some folks are not so great at slitting. So I, I'll try to avoid encouraging them to use an inner. I'm like, eh, maybe hold off because we don't need to do this twice. Because slitting, <laughs> if you've never done it, uh, as you do a CRT placement, slitting is one of the more difficult challenges because you're right at the end and you know, if you don't do it smoothly, you might have to start over from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're ever doing CRTs for the first time, we'll bring you some catheters and just practice slitting uh, and get that movement down because you don't want to learn when you're three hours into a case. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically for the passive um, fixation, it's just pretty much just kind of pushing it in as far as it can go. The same thing applies where you sometimes see the buckling. So as you push down, if you are not really sure if you're at the end of the, um, or you're at the end of the vein, then you should see your um, backside of your sheet just kind of 
pushing back a little bit. And sometimes we actually will say, I've seen people and I'll say, hey, be careful because you're actually doing way too much and it's coming all the way out and that will, you know, remove all your, um, remove your entire apparatus. So um, that's not what you want. All right, so um, here we're just kind of verifying that the lead is where you want it to be. So after you've put in your lead, before you say, hey, this is my position, you've checked all your stuff, then you also want to make sure that it's in the position that you want it. So for instance, in this particular example, you know, this particular branch had two um, branches, two sub branches right under it, right? Um, so here's a little bit more anterior, here's a little bit more mid. If I were to pick, I would want to go here a little bit more mid. However, let's say, and this looks like it tapers really nicely. Of course, this is an artist rendition, but let's say this was a little bit bigger and it was going all the way to the tip and then crossing back around, then that would not be where I would go unless I had an active fixation lead. Instead, I would go to the one that's a little bit more interior. So um, that's definitely something you want to make sure of. You want to make sure that you are not not too interior, because if you do, then you lose your entire benefit um, of getting the um, LV lead in place. Um, and um, so you just want to make sure of your positioning. And once you do, you check your leads again. Now, um, I will typically use the adjustable slitter. I love the adjustable slitter. It just kind of gives me that control, I feel. Um, but the universal slitter, um, it's basically, it's the same shape. Medtronic has one, St. Jude has one. Um, and I believe, I think everybody has like this type of slate shape. They also have an adjustable slitter for each one apart from St. Jude. I don't think St. Jude has, um, or Abbott has an adjustable slitter. Um, so even when I would do uh, St. Jude devices, I would say, okay, I want to use Medtronic delivery stuff because I slit with the adjustable slit and that's kind of how I've um, figured out my workflow. So, um, you know, and of course I'm spoiled for choice and that's the reason why I can do that. But when um, you're in a situation where you don't have to, then you'd have to become facile with um, all these slitters. Um, so really the main thing is that you need to hold the slitter steady while you pull your catheter back. And you will need help. You also need to make sure that nothing can catch the, the arm that you're pulling back, nothing can catch onto it um, at the same time. So things that can possibly catch on, sometimes when you have your clips um, at the end of the lead when you're testing, you really need to take those off because sometimes they can capture at the end and then you're pulling and next thing you know, everything is all over the place and you can pull things and not really realize it. Um, so that's one of the things. And then also if you fixate your hand that has the slitter somewhere, so you might not necessarily fixate your hand, you might fixate your arm on the bed or something just to keep that hand steady, that will definitely help you while you're slitting. So the action is you hold this hand, you have this other hand that has the, um, the catheter and you pull over it. And once you do that, and don't do it too slowly either, because once you do, then everything is going to fall apart, trust me. So you want to kind of go soon and do it out. So um, obviously, if this is something that you're going to do, like AJ said, um, we would be, you know, um, kind of showing you some examples and, you know, giving you some practice implements so that you can kind of practice as you go. Do you mind if I hop in real quick? Yeah. Yeah, so um, perfect uh, what you mentioned there about making sure nothing gets caught up. Uh, you really can't see it in this demo here in the picture, but most of these sheets have valves on them. So a good thing I always recommend is gathering that valve and putting it in your hand because it hangs off to the side and it can catch the drape as well. It will slow you down. So just gather the valve, get it out of the way. And then, yeah, as you said, one solid motion and you're going to be pulling I don't know if you can see me. Um, you want to avoid pulling it towards your chest because you may run out of length. We, uh, I used to work with a with a bigger doctor, and he would pull it right into his gut, and it would stop. And then we the lead would fall out of the channel of the slitter, or it'd get caught. So what can happen is the lead can actually get pinched in the slitter, and then you have to cut the 
piece by piece with scissors or start all over if it gets caught and pulls back. So you want to make sure when you're doing your pulling motion is you're pulling away from you, give yourself space. And it's like you're starting a lawnmower. If, if y'all ever, you know, mow the lawn, you just, your pull starting it like that all the way through one solid motion, no pauses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very important. Don't pull it towards the chest. That, no pulls, yeah. That's what I've had in fellowship. Uh, I did that once and I was like, oh, <laughs> and everybody just looked at me and I had to get those small scissors that are in there and just kind of cut through. <laughs> so that was very painful. You, you cut off the excess, I assume, and then just work your way down or? Basically, <laughs> it was tough. very painful. So, all right. So um, this was um, the example of the case um, that Dr. Sharif showed at the beginning of um, at the beginning that we were talking about. And as you can see, you know, this here was not very well pacified. Um, you know, you can see the um, balloon basically at the somewhere close to the os, but because there's that all that backflow, you can't really see what's happening um, moving forward. So maybe there might be a branch over there. Maybe there's a branch over there. I don't really know, but you can't really tell. Um, and so what you would want to do is actually see if you can either blow a little bit more. Um, in any case, for this particularly, they ended up, um, they couldn't opacify the CS fully, but what they ended up doing was just kind of going all the way to the end. And luckily they found a branch that ended up going laterally at the end. So, so to summarize, you know, the summary of your steps, you wanna get your venous access, RV lead placement. And the reason why you want to do RV lead placement is because um, you know, like we mentioned previously, for most of these patients, they have a left bundle branch block, which means that the right bundle is the only thing that is controlling your conduction. So if you hit that, which you have a high likelihood of doing when you're trying to find the CS, then that means that this patient has complete heart block for that brief period of time. So if what I typically will do is I will have my RV lead and I'll actually still hook it onto a backup rate so that at the very least, if I lose access, I don't have to, nobody has to scream or say, ah, there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, it's already pacing. And then we realize, oh, it's pacing. Okay, cool. We lost something there, but we're just kind of aware of it. But otherwise there's no emergency. We already have backup pacing. Everything's already been prepared. Um, and then you cannulate your coronary sinus. Um, we typically do that by basically, I typically will have my outer sheath, um, well, my inner sheath, my short sheath will already be in the patient, obviously. Um, I will have an outer sheath. Through that, I'll have the AL2. Um, and then through that, I will have a woolly wire. I typically use the woolly wire just because the end is so flimsy, it's able to go. The woolly and the stork are kind of the same. I typically will, don't use a J wire um, just because sometimes you just need that little bit of, you know, going through, because, um, if you have somebody with really bad, um, heart failure and that slit like, um, um, CS, um, OS, or if you have a valve, then that J wire can kind of work against you. So the woolly, um, really does help. Um, and then it also, um, there's some folks who say to use a glide. I do not like using a glide for, um, venous access. And the reason why I don't is because, you know, the glide will go wherever, wherever it may, it will make a way, even when there's no way. <laughs> so I tell people don't use the glide, especially for the vein, for the artery, it's kind of difficult for you to slice through the adventitia and all those layers. But for the vein, it's very easy for you to kind of go through the venous wall and then end up somewhere that you don't intend to and cause a dissection. So using the woolly wire, using a stork wire should be sufficient. Did you want to say something, AJ? No, uh, that's that's interesting. So I, I've seen a couple of dissections and I'm trying to remember what, what wire we we're using for that. And the does the glide come in a J-tip or it is a J-tip, right? It's just a little more traumatic, it sounds like. No, well, they have, I think they, ha they do have a J-tip glide, but they also have a straight glide. Oh, straight glide, yeah. Yeah, and so there's some folks who will use it, and I'm like, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I usually tell people don't. No. 
And then um, of course, you know, once you cannulate the coronary sinus, you go in, you perform your venogram, select the target vein, um, and then place your leads. And so you don't want, what I try to get people to do or to understand is, you know, you don't want you accessing the CS to be the hard part of the case. Typically the more difficult part of the case is actually getting your target branch. So the CS part, you should work towards your CS being, or accessing your CS being the easier part of the case. Um, so that once you get there, then you can get to the difficult part. Dr. Daffa, did you want to say something? Yes, very good, Matt. Excellent presentation. In fact, you have made so many things so simple. And uh, thank you also. I remember last year, uh, that was in um, Senteba, where you taught me how to use uh, the AL2. Uh, thank you very much, Ma. Uh, two questions first. We have many questions, but let's start with two first, because this is a hot topic, Ma. The two questions are, the uh, first two questions are, in CKD patient, what are the precautions that you take? Uh, CKD here not, doesn't necessarily mean that the patient is already in dialysis. Um, some of our patients here, they may be having that uh, uh, creatinine that is hovering around 200, 300, and you don't want to treat them into dialysis. Um, what, uh, what are the precautions you take from, uh, from the time of access to um, you get your venogram and you finish the case? Then the second question I also have is on um, uh, if you have a persistent left SVC, what are the way, because I have a counter such a case, uh, persistent left SVC, uh, what, how do you go about it, Ma, uh, in your practice? Okay, so for your first, um, your first question, which was CKD, um, yes. I will actually say that um, use as little contrast as possible. Um, and, we got very good within the past year of determining how much contrast we used because there was a time when we were, there was a shortage. I don't know if AJ, you remember this, there was a shortage of contrast um, because of COVID and supply chain and all this stuff. And so they would tell you, okay, yeah, for a cap, you only had, you know, for, for a whole hospital, you had like, 100 cc bottle and people were like pouring out 10 cc's and basically be like there you go good luck wow um, so um but basically what that ended up teaching you though is that some of the strategies that we already use for the venogram so i don't know how you guys do your venograms but basically doing the full contrast and then following that with a 20 cc push can actually give you such a good picture so much so that now for mine, I actually, I said, okay, how, how much can we push this? Can we do three cc's and then follow it with a 20 cc push? What does that do? And it does exactly the same thing. Um, and for, for those of you, you probably haven't used those yet, but the leadless pacemakers, we used to use like a hundred cc's of contrast because we were filling up the um, tubing with contrast and then you realize, oh, I, I would just use like three cc's and then push a whole lot of like 20 cc's of saline and it would give me everything that I needed to see. So realize yes. what you don't have to opacify everything. You just need <laughs> to be able to see a shadow. But then the second thing is I, you will typically see me use like a two-way stop clock, you know, even with the balloon, use like one cc and push it with um, saline and basically you'll see what you need. You just need to be on that pedal. So um, whoever is, you know, position yourself well, make that one shot count, that would be number one. The second thing is, you know, sometimes um, if somebody, if we're really worried about contrast, okay, the main place that you will need contrast is for the CS. So sometimes even for my access, I won't use contrast for that for a venogram. But what I will do is I will get access before I even open up the pocket. And the way Correct. that I do that is basically, um, you know, with the patient still closed, basically using my landmarks and saying, okay, just 
shooting for um, trying to get access. Once I do and I have a single wire down, then I use that as my guide for all the other wires. And the next ones, I don't do all three accesses outside. I just get, make sure I have one. And as long as I have one and it's going to the place where it needs to get to, then um, I will make my pocket and then I'll do the other two through the pocket. So um, um, you know, those are easy strategies that you can use for patients who have renal insufficiency. Because obviously you don't want to push somebody into um, dialysis. Dialysis you know, range. Yeah, mm. with your, with your, with your, so I, I'm in a typical case, I mean, it's a rare case that I use up to 10 cc's of contrast these days. So that's number one. Now for your persistent left SOC. Well, while we're on that subject, sorry. Um, I don't know, we, we talked about it last week. Um, so I don't know if the group remembers, but do you ever use EP catheters? Because sometimes an EP catheter can also be a way to to determine if you're in the CS with ever, without ever having to step on fluoro to try to navigate sometimes as well. Do you like a so CSL? I don't. And the reason why I don't is because the EP catheter is expensive. Because, you know, you you basically <laughs> added, like, you know, and especially for, for you to get into the CS, there's sometimes that you can get into the CS with a simple diagnostic catheter, but with yeah. in most patients who have heart failure, you know, where everything is already moved around, mm. it ends up being really difficult to get into the CS. So you'll find that it will be easy for you to get into the CS when you have a normal patient and you're just trying to get into the RV. Then all of a sudden it's like, why do I keep on getting into the CS? That never happens with a patient that you actually want to go into the CS. And that's, that's because true. those patients usually have a smaller CS os, their left atrium is bigger. There's all these things that will limit your mm. you know, access. So that's um, the reason why. And yes, it probably would be easier to do it with a um, CS, with a with a EP catheter, but the EP mm. catheters that are adjustable that will reliably get you there are also more than, you know, a thousand dollars. Yes, that's you fair. Can't really, yeah. I think the, the ones I always see is like the CSL, which I think those aren't too bad, but to your point, they're not, they're not cheap. It's yeah. not as cheap as a wire by any means. Yes, yeah, for sure. Okay. And then um, your other question was the persistent left SVC. So actually, the yes. persistent left SVC, you will get a CS lead there very easily because that's where it goes into. All right. So it's going to be huge. <laughs> and so you're not going to, you're figuring out what branch you're going to get into. That might be a little bit difficult because it will be, you will probably have to use a bigger balloon to occlude so that you'd be able to see exactly what the map looks like. Um, so your RV lead, your LV lead is not going to be the difficult one. The difficult one actually will be your RV lead because you have, to go into the atri you have to go into the atrium and then flip it around and then turn it in and then make sure that you have force. And so you're doing this curly cue, which is the reason why you have to kind of think to yourself, well, is it worth it for me to do all of that? Or should I just go for the right side? It's very correct. Because in case we're counter here, we have to just go to the right side and did it from the right side. Yeah. Because and then also <laughs> and also for me, when I'm whenever I'm placing a lead, I'm also always thinking about extraction. So right. When you put something into the a persistent left SVC, eh, extracting it is going to be, I mean, not that we're all hoping for extraction, but you never know. And then if you have to extract it, that will be a mother to do. And so you just, that those are the things that I'm thinking about. So usually like, if I have no choice, like I have a patient now who, whenever she needs a pacemaker, she, that's going to be her only choice is her persistent left SVC because she actually doesn't have a right-sided SVC. It's right-sided, it's like, it basically goes into the um, zygos and then comes back down. So she really doesn't have one. So um, for her, if she's going to get a pacer, either she's going to have to get a leadless pacemaker or she'll have to get it through you know, her persistent left. Um, so there are patients that are like that, that you have no choice, but um, otherwise I would go to the right. Great. Thank you very much, Emma. Then uh -huh. uh, again, you know, I keep thanking you for what you did teaching, uh, teaching me on how to use the AL2 uh, wire, sorry, oh, yeah. AL2 uh, diagnostic catheter. And over this right. time, 
Yes. So we have also learned how to use uh, the Oh, Dr. Edafra, we lost you. Oh, can you hear me, Nama? Okay, I can hear you now. You said you also learned how to use? Yes, the uh, the JR that. Looks oh. like we lost you again. Yeah. Dr. Crow, uh, do you mind if I take control and I can show some of the catheters that we're talking about? Sure. Okay, perfect. In the meantime, um, so we talked about, have you ever, uh, it sounds like you don't have a lot of trouble with this stuff, but have you ever uh, done groin access to get into the CS or? No. Okay. I try not to. Because like and the reason why is because, you know, like I'm fanatical about infections mm -hmm. and I do not want there to be an infection in the lead. So I try not mm -hmm. to mix the two. Um, there are some cases where we've had to go groin and, you know, and, but that's mostly for patients. I had a couple of cases recently where the patients um, had occlusions, venous occlusions. And mm -hmm. so the only way that we could open up the groin was um, open up the venous occlusion was by going through the groin. So, um, and we did this really cool thing um, that they're going to present at some CRT somewhere somehow. So once they get all the slides together, I'll show you guys, it was really cool. But um, there was basically a way where we were able to get access proximally, they put it in a balloon and then they pulled the wire down. So it was, it's, it's cool. It's really cool. They call it, he calls it the Dr. Rain, who's a interventional cardiologist with us. Um, he calls it the harpoon technique. So um, I think they're going to present it um, hmm. at some interventional conference, but they haven't gotten the slides together. Once they do, I'll definitely come back here and show it to you guys, but it's really cool. But um, yeah, that's the do. only time that I have actually done that. The rest of the times I try not to mix the groin and the heart even though technically it shouldn't everything should be clean but there's just something about the groin chest don't want to do it <laughs> i get it it's not the cleanest area too for all of our patients so um yeah so we've done have you done a snare before like so we've done snare yeah. techniques you have mm -hmm. those are always interesting um so i don't know I, i'm sure that oh dr daffe is back yeah i'm back sorry <laughs> it's my network so no I was saying, yeah, I was saying that uh, we have also learned how to use uh, the GR uh, diagnostic catheter, uh -huh. uh, so uh, and also the lima. So we can start a case with the lima uh, to get the coronary sinus. If we try like one to two minutes, if it's not working, we change over to uh, to either GR or we just move straight to the AL2 and the results has been very fantastic. So that is the AL2 makes it more very expensive. No, it's not. So why not it's just the go same price? The AL2? <laughs> why are you making yourself suffer? <laughs> because I can bet you this, you will get it a hundred percent of the time with the AL2. Yes, you are correct. I have never seen somebody say, you know what, I didn't get it with the AL2. Let me try with the JR. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, it's from JR before you move to AL2. AL2 I is the final the arbiter. Oh, if Jesus, there is a the final. Use it as the first, man. You're wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> have yeah, you ever, very good. Mm. Have you ever seen uh, the Jackie before? Doesn't the Jackie kind of look like the AL2? No, no, the Jackie is, is the one that, yeah. That's the Jackie right here. Yeah, that's so, the yeah, one it's, that... Um, that nice, is Jackie from, okay? From the, from the, for the wrist, right? Yeah, a it's a radio. I think it is a radial one. We actually yeah. will use it. Um, so I, I prefer the L2 because you can deliver through it if you need to. Um, the Jackie, mm -hmm. you cannot, obviously. It's just a wire only. But sometimes if they have a, if you need something a little smaller, you can use the Jackie. And one thing that we've shown here is you can telescope these, um, these catheters. So you can actually put an inner catheter like a Jackie into an inner. So then you can work your way in, you know, get the Jackie into place, then run your inner, then run your outer. So if you have one of those problems where you almost need to dilate up or telescope your way in, you have this additional support system as well. Okay. 
Uh, Dr. Joma, this, uh, this straight uh, coronary uh, sinus catheter, I have not used those one. I only use the curve one. So those straight one, under what condition do you use them? I, uh, I do it's see the right sided. Okay, good. So basically, for only the right for, sided, mm. yeah, yes. that's where I've used them, is mainly mm. for the right sided. Just because, you know, coming from the right side, you don't need as much of a bend just because of your angle. Yeah. Um, so I usually will use the AL2, like over, it'll be um, over an AL2. And then, um, you know, because if you use the others, it kind of kicks you out. So just yeah. using a straight basically delivers you where you need to be. Mm. Can, can you go back to the next, the, the, the slides before this? This one? Or this the Medtronic the, ones? The slide before this one. Yeah, I think it's that one. Yeah, no, not this. this yeah, this one. This uh, smaller one down, what's, under what condition do you use it? The last on the down, no? Down, oh, down, this? down, down. I, I have no, no idea. <laughs> I don't know. This last one. Uh, I, I can't see, sorry. They, they are smaller. They are not uh -huh. as uh, uh, bulky. They are uh -huh. smaller. And uh, they look they look as if they are almost the size of the of the inner slit. If you are using if you are going to slit twice, this smaller one down, yeah, this last one down, yes, yes, that one here, yes. that looks like a right to me. What do you think? Yeah, that one looks like a right. If you look um, at the like a right, okay, right. yeah. yeah. And so um, I don't think of, I think that they just did that for style purposes. It's, I don't yeah. think, I think they're all the same size. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, they're all the same size. Yeah, I don't know so, why they put multiple straights here that make it look yeah. like they're decrementing. But yeah, no, I agree. I think that's a right-sided. Yeah. Then so, I also noticed, uh, Dr. Jama, that the, um, what, uh, the, the Venus, uh, the pillar away sheet, for St. Jude's is 10.5. Uh -huh. Yes. Why for Metronic is nine. Yes. And if you use a pill away sheet of nine and uh -huh. you bring in if and you bring in uh St. Jude uh, uh St. Jude uh, CS CS catata, it will not end it will uh, it, yeah, it you will, have, you have it difficult. Yes, you have to upgrade it to 10.5. Well you have to you, use an 11. So you use an eleven outer. You mean for the for the short sheath, right? You can use a ten with the Saint Jude. I thought that it was a ten point five though. It's so the outer. This is a. I don't know why it says nine point oh. I pulled this off their website. Uh, the universal is actually ten point oh six outer diameter. It says in the boxes uh -huh. at least. But the okay. ten point oh six with with tolerance because we always use a ten and a half in in St. Louis. And then when I got to Boston, they're like, no, you can use a ten. <laughs> Uh, which okay. I learned pretty quickly. Yeah, you can, it'll fit through a 10 because of uh, tolerance. Okay. The way they work. So it will fit, but it's still a size bigger. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's obviously. Um, so I always recommend a 10 if you don't know what you're going to use, because it's always to, easier than having to put a wire in, replace your short sheath and just start with the larger one. Mm -hmm. But sorry, I interrupted. Go on. No, 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 you're good. So... I think I had some cases that I just kind of wanted to show really quickly. Um, oh, I can give you that control. Yeah. Yeah. Just one second. Oh, really quick. Uh, the We were talking about slitting. Here is the yes. Universal Abbott. Um, they do have a guide right here. If you see this little groove, just make sure that it's lined up. If you, if you break your hands, if your hands aren't straight on, if you kind of tilt it inward or at the wrong angle, it can catch. The newer one is going to have like a little bitty what like a little guide scoop like that actually cups the wire farther down to keep it from dislodging. But for now, just make sure your hands are straight or you're going to have a bad time. Let me give you back control. Sorry, I'm fighting here. Okay. You are now the host. All right. So let's see. All right. So I just wanted to kind of um, show a few cases of some challenging hmm. ones. 
Um, there was, this was a guy who has a history of um, like a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then you could tell kind of that this was going to be a little bit difficult because if you can see, you know, so this is the AL2 and it's gone in and then it kind of goes down and then goes up. And so our issue here was that it kept on, we could not move this across at all. Like this was the extent that it pretty much stopped. So trying to get it in, um, we were not able to, um, and we tried that for hours. Um, and these are like different pictures. And this is where we ended up with this case <laughs> where we ended up having just a dual chamber um, at the end of it, just because um, we weren't able to get up into it. Um, my hospital has changed um, system. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a full, the full satisfying, you know, results of this. But basically, this is the same gentleman um, who has his dual chamber. And now we came in trying to do the, um, came in again, after a while to try to do this um, LV lead, um, because he had really bad heart failure, biventricular, um, and a huge left bundle. And so the idea was, okay, what can we do to help this guy before going into transplant or anything like that? Um, and then you can see here that as we go in there, look at all these branches, so small. Like, mm. he has like pretty much nothing, right? So here you can see everything is anterior. It has some stuff up there, but there's this one down here, which kind of trickles into the lateral wall. Um, and let me go here. You can kind of see it here. So there where you can kind of see this one going across. And that's pretty much where we ended up putting in the lead. Um, but it just ended up being just such a um, cluster. And um, second case that we did, we actually had to use a whirly vein selector. Um, so the vein selector um, is similar to, I think um, for those of you who do interventionals and do, um, Dr. Deffer probably know about this, um, where you have your sub selector sheaths and you have your glide sheath. Basically it's a small sheath that you can deliver a wire through. Sometimes the wire is just an 014 wire, but pretty much what you can do is deliver the wire into your target branch, go um, over it with your vein selector, and then you can kind of go over that with your inner um, and basically just kind of go, go up that way. So, um, I'll use this example um, in this patient who had a pacing induced cardiomyopathy um, where we were able to, you know, the best branch that you could see was this lateral branch here. And I don't know if you guys can appreciate that bend over there, here where yeah. it's very difficult you know, to get through. So if we had gone up a little bit further, you'll see that that actually made a curly cue back. Um, and here you have a small dissection <laughs> there, but that's where the branch is, right? So we end up having to, um, let's see, can I? So we end up having to use our vein selector, let's see here. Yeah, so it's kind of going to come through here. Um, we end up using our vein selector. Unfortunately, I didn't really take a picture of it or I did take a picture, but they didn't save it. <laughs> um, these other branches were just too small. We couldn't really put a um, lead through there. We tried and could not. Um, and we ended up putting this lead into that branch um, and ended up being um, a successful case where it's there's good lateral uh, movement or lateral placement of the lead. So pretty much the way that we did it was that we used the, um, the vein selector, put actually a woolly through that, um, went up there with the vein selector. Once we were able to select the vein, then we put the woolly down, took out the vein selector, 
went there with a straight um, subselector over the um, outer sheath um, and then put the straight, um, the subselector down, took out your um, wire and then were able to deliver the uh, lead through that. And um, I think that was um, it pretty much. We have a, we had a few more slides, um, but it's just basically kind of talking about how you can use the subselectors and how they help you um, once they actually give you access to the vein itself. Um, and when you are withdrawing or when you are trying to slit this, you should actually pull your subselector back into your main body of your sheet before you mm -hmm. slit um, mm -hmm. so that you're not putting too much force on the lead itself. Um, remember that, um, you know, there are your phrenic nerve kind of goes around that lateral wall where you're trying to deliver your pacing lead. And so it's not unusual for you to have phrenic stimulation. So you always want to test for that. Um, and then the final thing we were talking about is the QLV. So basically um, this was a method um, that was um, discovered or it was one of the ways that you look to see what the best branch could be. I mean, obviously people don't really do this, but when you have placed your lead measuring the QLV, which is the measurement of the QRS to the peak on the LV EGM, um, if it's greater than 100 milliseconds, then it can actually show you that there is um, going to be a better uh, prediction of response to um, bioventricular pacing. So you have here two examples, you know, number one and number two, this particular um, patient or this lead placement is, will probably be better for you because pacing here would have a better response. You have synchronized the heart a little bit more than you would with this patient who just had a 90 millisecond QLV. Um, of course, this assumes that you have an abundance of choice. Um, so most of the time, what you're trying to do is just trying to get it where you can. But um, if you do have two leads and you have the time and you're able to get into them, then maybe trying to figure out a QLV will definitely help you, particularly in those patients who have um, a really um, bad heart failure that you're trying to um, improve um, their heart function. I, I think it also works for um, selecting your cathode as well. Um, mm -hmm. So once when you're trying to optimize later in clinic or, you know, uh, as we're as you're closing up us in the programming side. Um, mm -hmm. So there are different algorithms like um, auto VEX select and Abbott. Uh, I'm sure Medtronic has an equivalent that do a surrogate of QLV, but QLV is always something you can run as well and see where's our best, best cathode and then see if it's a viable threshold as well, if there's phrenic yeah. nerve stem, things like yeah. that. So this just talks about, oh, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Keru, sorry, sorry, man. Can I take you to uh, take you back to the first case you just showed? First case? Yeah. Not this one. This one. No, the first, yeah, the first case when um, the guy with, uh, uh, ischemical disease. Uh, yeah, mm. this is a case. This is a case. Now, uh -huh. in this case, in this case, do you think that um, options like uh, ROBB and LBB pacing can it be an option here? Then two, uh, surgical um, epicardial lead, uh, lead placement can it be an also an option? For example, um, we have the ROV lead in and also the uh, ROA lead in, then inviting the surgeon, uh, because of the difficulty, inviting the surgeon to place uh, epicardial lead of, uh, that is the LV as an epicardial lead. Can it be an option here? Oh yeah, for sure. Like that is always our last option. But the thing is, you know, placement of the LV lead is still somewhat of a, like a, you know, not a sternotomy, but basically you're doing cardiac surgery, you know, yeah. the procedure. And so it's still major surgery. So, and in a patient who has really bad heart failure. So if you mm. can do it, you know, intravascularly, then, you know, we try as much as possible, but that's always 
understood that, hey, if this person does need LV lead pacing, um, then if we're not able to get it, you know, with our classic way, then you put a bi -V can and the surgeon is supposed to put in an LV lead. Okay. So that's always I a given. Then for the left bundle pacing, in this particular yes. case, it wasn't um, an option because left bundle pacing wasn't a thing back then. Um, it's interesting because left bundle pacing is not possible in everyone, right? Um, the idea is that, but that you know, you're able to capture the left bundle and you're able to use that conduction system, but sometimes the block is not at the level of the left bundle. Sometimes it's below that. Sometimes it's even at the level of the muscle. And so you're not really able to cause synchrony because the idea is that desynchrony is contributing to the heart failure and resynchronization is able to help. So sometimes even you doing a left bundle is not going to help because the, your, your block is below that. It. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> Dr. Curl, for your um, for your surgical LV placement, do you have them place two typically? Yes. Or okay. Yeah. Usually have them place two. Because I mean, there's so many times that you'll have um, situations where they'll lose capture. I, I don't know what happens in the pericardium. It's as if there's something going on yeah. and it just kind of, you know, your thresholds go up and then or it, it's just lost capture. And so you you you're better off with another. So it's kind of a pseudo quad lead ish. Yeah, get options. Uh, yeah, and just yeah. for everyone else's knowledge, for those bailouts, you will need a different uh, can. So you'll need a, bi, a bipolar, bipolar LV can, which yeah. if you don't have a lot on hand, I will tell you, you're probably going to get more quartet cans, but we can always work to get you one if you have a planned um, case. So just let us know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I so basically. Oh, this is a complete distraction is about slitting. So if you have something else, I, I just uh, had a question for you. Uh, do uh, you do for your slit? Do you do, is it, I think it's with the Whirly method where you set up the table and you, you set up the table, uh, parallel or, um, perpendicular to the patient kind of like with, with their arm would be, and then slit that direction or what's your typical slitting angle, I guess. So what is my typical slitting direction? I don't know if you've seen that technique where they, they you'll actually no. roll a table in and they'll like stretch it all out on a table oh, and no. then I turn, don't, don't, don't. you turn like towards the patient's head and slit that direction. I don't know if you've ever done that. Well, what I do is, mm -hmm. okay, let's say the patient, the patient is in front of me. We're doing all the things that da, 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 da. patient is in front of me right here. Mm -hmm. So I will have my, my right hand is typically the hand that I will hold the slitter in. So mm -hmm. I will put the slitter, put everything and then go through um, the header with it. And then with my left hand, that's, I pull back. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what method that is, but that's basically what I do. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's like a whole new table method that people started doing about two, three years ago that. Uh, if you have a technique for slitting, just use that technique. <laughs> I yeah. would say for, for people on the call, you know, once, once you get it down, I would just say, use that technique, whatever works best for you. Um, but yeah, I didn't know if you'd ever seen that. It's, it's no, I haven't. interesting. No, I'm, about to, I'm about to Google it. <laughs> I think whirly. it's like the Whirly method. Like, I don't know. Seth Whirly is, he's branded everything pretty well. So I know he's like, I was like, what is this? The Whirly method. <laughs> so the Whirly method. Okay. Which Whirly method? I think, okay. I think that's what it is. Oh, I'll find it. Um, Wait, send it, put it in the chat but um yeah so um you know this is pretty much like kind of um <laughs> kind of you know a, a route to like okay if you have a difficult cs cannulation like what you should do sometimes looking at things in different views can definitely help um using different guiding catheters there's so many times that i have been using a standard and then i get 
one that just has a little bit more reach and all of a sudden everything becomes a little bit easier and it's like, oh, this is what I've been missing. Um, that's helpful. Um, using different wires. And so, you know, your, I mean, you guys are more, I, I think better used to the wires than I am. And sometimes I ask for the help of my interventional colleagues. Hey, look at this. Do you think there's a wire that you can suggest that would actually help things out? And um, because I have seen stiffer wires. So for the, um, for the lead wires, I typically will use a, a simple whisper wire. Um, but you know, there's the whisper extra support that's a little bit bigger. Um, there's a little, has a little bit more support. There's the BMW, um, which is like the balanced middleweight. Um, and then you have, you know, the Iron Man and, you know, Tarumos and <laughs> all of those ones that are really like, they sound very strong, <laughs> which um, I typically will use, number one, a lot of times they'll give too much support. You, you still need a little bit of flimsiness with the lead um, mm. to be able to steer it to the right place. But if you get the right wire, sometimes even those bends can actually be straightened out with the wire and you end up mm. putting your sheath in a little bit easier. So just kind of trying to figure out, okay, based off of what you have in front of you, um, you know, once you do your venogram, trying to figure out, okay, your next step um, would be really important. Um, and then using, don't, not being afraid of using an inner sheath, you know, the inner sheath can be your friend. Um, the use of um, the AL2 is definitely helpful. Sometimes if you cannot, you know, get into the CS, then actually doing a coronary, um, you know, a coronary um, shot and doing a late phase will actually help you in those ways. I haven't had to do one for years, but you know, in one patient, it was kind of really helpful. Um, and then of course, now that there's left bundle branch pacing, that can be an option, but just realize before you make a commitment and open up a new can, make sure that you are actually having good um, capture of the left bundle um, because you don't want a situation where your end result is not much better than what you had at the beginning. And now you have the added um, costs um, and the added complication rate of putting in a left bundle as well. And uh, I think, oh, we, um, there are a few um, examples of coronary um, sinus dissections here that um, I think would be helpful. Basically, if you see stuff like this, like that, just kind of know that this is not cool. And this is the reason why, you know, so when we're um, putting in our um, balloon, you want your balloon to be in the main body of the CS and not into the branch because this is what can happen in this case. So in this particular patient, they were able to uh, place the um, lead through that, but sometimes everything just closes down and you're not able to do anything. And then sometimes in rare cases, a CS dissection can cause a significant pericardial effusion. Uh, most of the time it doesn't, but sometimes it can. So you have to monitor the patient, make sure the patient is um, in good stead before you let them go home. And uh, that's the end of that. Fantastic. Thank okay. you. Uh, yeah. We had a question from Dr. Chigozi about um, decreasing order of preference for uh, best coronary sinus tributary. I think in that presentation, there was a good image that you could maybe go through where it shows lateral yes. posterior. Let me see here. <laughs> So I think that this was one of the um, one of the screens that we had um, that showed the different tributaries. Um, what we'll tell you is either posterior lateral or lateral is really the best that you can go through. Um, you really don't want it to be anterior. Anterior lateral can be acceptable really anywhere in the lateral sphere and as basal as you can. So basal or mid is um, most preferable. 
Um, nowadays, like I said, mentioned, because we have the quad leads, um, we end up either in the basal or the mid um, just by, um, just because of the, by virtue of the number of poles that we have. Um, sometimes you have to jam it in and you end up with kind of a lead in the apical, um, but in the apex. But the rule is the closer it is to the RV lead, the less you want it. And so posterior lateral, lateral would be your um, highest ones. There's sometimes you can go through an MCV and it'll end up lateral that can be um, a good lead for you to do. So as long as it ends up being um, as lateral as you can, that's pretty much where you would want it. Any other Fantastic. questions? Okay. Well. Fantastic. If there are more questions, please post them into our larger group and we can make sure to answer them and address them on future calls. But really, really appreciate uh, Dr. Sharif. And then uh, obviously, Dr. Kuro, thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your out of your Mother's Day to, uh, to educate us on LV leads. And um, yeah, this is really enlightening. So we appreciate it. Thank you. All. Thank you all for coming on the call. We really appreciate it. Yeah. We will go ahead and skip our uh, questions. We'll push that to another time. So everyone have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you, AJ. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Thanks, AJ. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Ma, for the great work. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Yes, Ma. Yes, Ma. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. <laughs> How do you people celebrate Mother's Day now? We Anglican, we celebrate, we celebrate, we Anglicans are Catholic, we celebrated since uh, March. Last Why is it that it's now you are celebrating Mother's Day? This Ma is, uh, Ma uh, can you answer? <laughs> this is America. I don't know. Is it only America? <laughs> is it this late? I'm not sure. I think it it's, is. I don't even really know. It's Rwandan Mother's because Day too. The, Oh, the, 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 Roman, yeah. the Roman Catholics and the Anglicans and uh, many other Orthodox churches, they celebrated their own uh, since March. Well, yeah. I only know that when, so this has been the excuse when I tell my, uh, when I don't tell my mother Happy Mother's Day. She's like, you didn't tell me Happy Mother's Day. I was like, it's not the same in America. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so now I have to call her today. <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, I'll see you guys later. Take care. See you later. Enjoy your yeah, weekend. Yeah, take care, man. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I think you have to end the call. Uh -huh.